life is going well, we claim to believe in many things. We believe in God and in the gospel and the power of forgiveness and prayer. But when life gets difficult, when our assumptions are shaken, when we stand on the brink of some kind of death, it's in those moments that it becomes clear what gods we actually fear and trust in. The story in Exodus 14 today takes place at just that kind of time. Prior to this time, life has been going well for the people of Egypt. Their economy has been booming. Their leaders have pushed out dangerous foreign influences. They've rebuilt their national military. But when the Lord, the God of Israel, strikes Egypt with ten plagues, when their economy and their assumptions are shaken, when many of them not only stand at the brink of death but are plunged into it, when life gets difficult for the Egyptians, it becomes clear that the Egyptians don't fully trust in or believe their gods, like Horus and amun Re, and they don't fully trust in or believe their magicians or temples or priests. No, what the Egyptians fear and trust in most deeply is their military, their chariots and their horsemen and their archers. Their other gods haven't been able to stand up against the Lord God of Israel, but they still have some belief that their military can. And that is where we pick up the story. The slaves who have just been set free from Egypt, the Israelites, are on the road out of captivity when they receive a strange request from the Lord in verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of pi Hahirath, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baals of Baal shall encamp facing it by the sea. What Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Go corner yourself. That's essentially what the Lord is telling the Israelites to do, to corner themselves by the sea, where there are no exits or ways to escape. Meanwhile, he says he's going to make sure that the Egyptians pursue after them and don't turn back. Now, the the Lord gives his reasoning for this, but his explanation is kind of cryptic. He says he wants to get glory over Pharaoh. And so I imagine some of the Israelites are probably thinking to themselves, I don't know, this sounds kind of risky, doesn't it? But probably most of them are, are responding, oh, no, don't worry about it. Didn't you see those plagues back in Egypt? I bet the Lord will call down fire from the sky and consume all the Egyptians before they even get close to us. After all, life has been going well for the Israelites, and so it's easy for them to believe in the Lord, and so the text says that they do what he told them to do. Meanwhile, we see that the Lord is doing what he said he would do, starting in verse 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people, and they said, What is this that we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out to fight him. At this time, the chariot was the most advanced and lethal military technology known to man. Imagine you're an Israelite foot soldier, and maybe you have like a wooden spear or a pitchfork or something. Meanwhile, you've got two fully grown war horses that are armored. They're charging straight at you, and there's soldiers behind them shooting arrows and spears at you. It would be terrifying. Except the Israelites aren't terrified yet. You see, they haven't seen these chariots coming at them. And so they're still probably kind of defiantly talking with their friends, like, hey, guys, it's coming. How many, how many Egyptians do you think the Lord is going to kill today? And they laugh. But their laughter isn't going to last for very long. Picking up again in verse 9. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by pi Hahirath in front of Baals of Bon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? 
what have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. When life had been going well for the people of Israel, it was easy for them to believe in the Lord. But the Lord hasn't called fire down from the sky to consume their pursuers. No, instead they see themselves facing a wall of horses charging straight at them. Yes, the Lord is just doing what he said he told them he was going to do, but they're standing on the brink of death. And it's in this moment when we see what the Israelites actually fear and trust in. And it apparently is not the Lord, the God who just freed them from Egypt. And it's not even Moses, their leader, who led them out. No, what the Israelites fear and trust in is probably what they're talking about right now. They're probably saying to each other, Oh gosh, we're trapped. Why did we believe that the Lord had the power to deliver us? No, the, the only gods that I believe in right now are those chariots charging straight at us. <laughs> We shouldn't be too judgmental towards the Israelites, though, because we do this ourselves, right? When life gets difficult, when we stand on the brink of some kind of death, we doubt the Lord, that he has the power needed to deliver us. And it's in those moments when we're doubting that we need people to remind us to believe in the Lord even when life is getting difficult. And that is what Moses does for the Israelites, beginning in verse 13. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. You see, Moses had learned from personal experience when the, that the Lord doesn't always deliver us according to our expectations. In his youth, he had expected the Lord to deliver the Israelites by his own hand, but then the Lord hadn't cooperated with his plans. Instead, life had gotten more difficult for Moses. It had taken over 40 years, but finally, after those 40 years of waiting, the Lord had begun to deliver the Israelites through his leadership. And so now, even though the chariots of Egypt are charging at him, even though his fellow Israelites are doubting, Moses believes that the Lord does have the power needed to deliver. But in light of Moses' belief, he, the Lord's response to him in verse 15 is strange. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. I imagine in his mind, Moses is trying to convince himself, Okay, Lord, I believe that you can deliver us, even though life is getting difficult. So can't you just kill these Egyptians before they get too close? The Lord has a plan that Moses doesn't understand or expect. Yes, the Lord says that he is going to get glory over Pharaoh and his chariots, but he also wants the Israelites to do something. He wants them to go into the midst of the sea, and, and Moses may be wondering to himself, why, Lord? Isn't that just more difficulty than it ha we have to have? Isn't it just going to make life harder for us? Couldn't some of us get killed in the process? And I've had similar thoughts as well about the ways that the Lord wants to deliver us that aren't expected or things that I understand. When he asks us to forgive those that wrong us, to pray for those who are persecuting us, to respond to those who insult us by blessing them. Sometimes the Lord's way of delivering us from the brink of death seems like it's actually plunging us further into it. And yet the Lord still shows that he has the power to deliver even when we are doubting him. We see in verse 19. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. 
Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So this big tornado-like thing with fire in the middle of it gets between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And initially, I imagine the Israelites are saying to themselves, okay, Lord, a little late here, but it looks like you're finally going to kill these Egyptians. <laughs> but then no Egyptians get killed. The cloud just stands there. And then Moses opens up the sea and tells them to go into the middle of it. And keep in mind that at this time, the sea was associated with chaos and death and destruction, and people couldn't swim. So the Israelites, they may be asking themselves, is the Lord plan on killing them or us? It's becoming clear that the Lord has the power needed to deliver us, but does he have the mercy as well? Maybe he's just going to take revenge on us for doubting him. And then things get even worse. Verse 23. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. As they're fleeing across the seabed in disarray, the Israelites have to know that they can't defend themselves against the Egyptian chariots. They'll just sweep in and slaughter them. I imagine the Israelites are crying, we're dead, we're dead, Lord have mercy. It seems like a foregone conclusion until we get to verse 24. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the host of Pharaoh that followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. One moment in the Egyptian charioteers crying out, how many slaves do you think I can kill today? The next moment, the chariot that he trusted in stalls, and he cries out, it's a trap, just moments before a wall of water plunges him to death. Meanwhile, the Israelites emerge from the waters crying, the Lord has delivered us from the Egyptians. Not just from the Egyptians, the Lord has delivered us from death. And we see the result of this beginning at verse 30. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. When, they, when life had gotten difficult, the Israelites had doubted the Lord. So can you imagine them looking into the cold, dead eyes of the Egyptians and saying to themselves, that could have been us. We doubted the Lord just like they did. We trusted the power of their chariots and their horsemen more than we did the Lord. The Lord has delivered us. The Israelites can see that the Lord has the power and the mercy needed to deliver them. But they have this question ringing in their hands, heads. Why has the Lord had that mercy? Now that question would take centuries to be answered, but those of us who know Jesus today know why the Lord has that mercy. Because the true Israelite, who did not doubt the Lord, even when life got difficult, and even when he stood on the brink of death, was plunged into death for our sins and our doubts and our rebellions, for our trust in other gods. And as a result of that, even more than the Israelites, we know that the Lord has the power and the mercy needed to deliver us. 
So even when we stand on the brink of some kind of death, even when the Lord makes our lives more difficult, when he asks us to pray for those who are persecuting us, to bless those who are insulting us, to share with the gospel of someone we're afraid of, we trust that the Lord, if he leads us into the waters, will lead us out. Because we know from what the Lord has done that he has the power and the mercy needed to deliver us from death. 